Okay, now we're ready. So we're inching ever so closer to the great and glorious day that our Savior and Lord broke into human history as one of us with his birth some 2,000 years ago. And as we lead up to his birthday, we have been reflecting on the true meaning of Christmas by looking at various aspects of Christ's advent. Now, that is his coming. And Advent, as I've mentioned as we've been moving through this little series, really speaks to two Advents. His first Advent, which has already occurred when he came in human flesh, lived that sinless life, and was himself the embodiment of the gospel, and yet the promise of his second coming when he will come to establish his millennial reign here on earth. In the first week of this series, we looked at our hope, which is founded in the fulfilled promise of the Messianic child, which was prophesied, we saw, back in Isaiah chapter 7 and verses 10 to 14. Um, We learned, secondly, that one of the three responses to that hope is faith in our second week. And we learned that genuine faith is an unwavering trust in someone, who of course is God, and in something which is his promises. Now, we examined faith last week through the tale of two faiths shown through the responses of Zechariah and Mary to the announcements of their respective children, John the Baptist and Jesus. You'll recall that Zechariah displayed disbelieving doubt that demanded evidence, while Mary, on the other hand, exercised simple faith that believed the promise that was given to her, the prophetic announcement through the angel Gabriel. Now, this week we're going to look at a second response to our hope, and that response is joy. And we're going to tell this response through the tale of two kings. So if you would please open up your Bibles to Matthew, the reading we did this morning, Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to be looking this morning at verses 1 through 12. Verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, in our passage this morning, we're going to encounter two kings, one of whom is the reigning self-appointed imposter claiming to be the king of the Jews, who is Herod. And the other is God's appointed king and Messiah, who is, of course, Jesus Christ. And make no mistake that God's king, Jesus, is the main character in this drama, even though we're not going to encounter him until we reach verse 9. Now, in our story, Matthew uses the supporting cast of characters to identify three primary ways that the world responds to the biblical Jesus, three different ways that the world responds to the truth of Jesus Christ. The first one we're going to find in verses 3 through 6, and that is astounding indifference. We're going to see this amazing indifference to the news of this messianic child. The second one we're going to find in verses 7 through 8, and that I've labeled treacherous hostility. So we're going to see people that are indifferent to Christ. We're going to see people that are hostile Christ. And then finally, lastly, we're not left without the focus of our message today, which is those who respond in joyful worship to the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we'll see this in verses 9 through 12. Now, these three responses, I want to suggest, provide us with a mirror with which we can evaluate ourselves. And in a very real way, you and I are in this story because our response to Jesus is found in one of these three responses. So as we're working through this, be thinking about this, and I'll ask you reflectively as we look at each one, does this response resemble you? And you can think that through. Now, this is important because which group we belong to is going to have eternal consequences. Now, as we did last week, we'll start to work our way through the text verse by verse, and we'll start, as we did last week, by looking at the setting and the supporting cast in verses 1 and 2, and we'll spend a little bit of time here because it's important to establish these characters so that we can see how they respond as we proceed through the text. 
So follow along with me as I read verses 1 and 2 in chapter 2. Matthew says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So the story opens, as our story did last week, in Jerusalem, where Herod reigns, but it's going to switch and later move to Jesus' birthplace, which is called Bethlehem of Judea. Now, Jesus, uh, uh, Matthew expresses it this way because there are two Bethlehems. So on the top side of this picture, you'll see a Bethlehem that is up near Galilee, and that is called Bethlehem of Galilee. But the place that we're talking about is the southern Bethlehem, which is about six miles or 10 kilometers south of Jerusalem, and this was called Bethlehem of Judea. So he's being specific about where the events of this start. Now in the opening scene, the Magi from the east arrive in Jerusalem, and as we'll see in verse three, their arrival is gonna stir up the entire city as well as Herod himself. Now, the Magi are the main characters in the supporting cast. So I wanna spend just a couple minutes to think about who they are or, or to reflect on who these Magi are. And I'll start by saying who they're not, separating facts from some of the fictitious depictions of the Magi that we have from our songs that we sing around Christmas and from the various nativity scenes that we see. The first thing that they are not is actual kings. And we have this great Christmas hymn, there's no reason to eliminate the hymn, We Three Kings of Orient Are, but they were not actual kings, but in a twist of interesting fate, they are king makers, and we'll see how that's important in verses nine to 12. Second, there were probably not three of them, and this was a tradition that likely arose from the fact that there were three gifts, but rather it was probably a large um, a contingent of men and their supporting cast that were coming to worship uh, or trying to find and then worship the baby Jesus. Now, I think we can probably just conclude this because their arrival stirred up the whole city, which at that time was probably about 80,000 people, and King Herod. So it had to be a large, a large enough and noticeable enough crowd to have gotten that kind of attention. And thirdly, the Magi were not actually at the birth of Jesus, which most of our nativity scenes show. Three kings gazing on the baby Jesus in his manger. They probably showed up somewhere between 40 days and up to two years after his birth. And the easiest clue for that, there's really two clues. One is we'll see that he had been born, which means they weren't showing up at his actual birth. But secondly, we'll see in the text that they encountered Jesus in a home which was not where he was actually born. So this was set sometime after his actual birth. Now, getting back to our basic question then, who are they once we've separated the, fa the fiction from the past? What they were was originally a caste of Persian priests. They were a priestly caste in Persia in what is today modern day Iran. They were teachers of science, including mathematics, astronomy, medicine and philosophy, and they were teachers of religion as well. They were responsible for anointing future kings, so this was my comment earlier about they are king makers, um, as they will do symbolically when we, they encounter Jesus in verses nine to 12. Now, moving forward in history, the Magi were the, were the ones that were called wise men in Daniel's time. And Daniel, if you recur, recall, served in Nebuchadnezzar's court. And these wise men uh, served in this court as well. And this is going to explain another question that that text raises in just a minute. But perhaps most important, what we need to know about these magi is as the religious leaders, they were Gentile, pagan idolaters. They were Gentile, pagan idolaters, which is three words for unbelievers. These were unbelieving individuals. Their religious rites included astrology and divination and incantations, all of which the Old Testament strictly forbade as practices of priests, yet 
God is going to use these improbable men to herald or be a testimony to the arrival of Jesus and to worship Israel's messianic king. In other words, what we're going to see from these men is that God breaks through their idolatry and he saves them, proving to all of us that nobody is beyond God's reach in salvation. Now, we round out the opening scene with the text explanation of why they have come in verse 2, and that is to find the king of the Jews. And again, I want you to note the text, that the, the tense of the verb in the text, which says, the king of the Jews who has been born. Okay, so he's not coming to predict a birth. He's coming to see a birth and to respond to this particular birth, which I think should beg a couple of questions on our mind. The first one is, how did the Magi know? Remember, they're pagan idolaters. How did they know that the king of Jews, of the Jews, had been born? And more interestingly, how did they know his identity? How would they have known his identity? Now, the first answer we get right in the text of verse 2. It says that they knew he had been born because they saw a star. Now, most of your verses probably say a star rising or a rising star and that is the literal translation of the Greek there so they saw this rising star which is extraordinarily bright in the sky in the east so this is how they knew well okay that's impressive a star but how is it that a star was the thing that allowed them to know that this child had been born and something about his identity well, in order to find the answer to that, when you turn back to the Old Testament, the first five books, the book of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, chapter 24, and I want you to follow along as I read the verses 15, and I think through verse 20 here. So, Numbers 24, starting in verses 15, here is what is recorded by Moses. Uh, again, just the setting here, this is Israel's about to invade uh, a king's territory by the name of Balak. And Balak is talking to a prophet named Balaam, and he's trying to get them to curse the nation of Israel so they won't defeat him. And then here is what Balaam says in response to that request, starting in verse 15. Then he took up his discourse, that's Balaam, and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the oracle of the man whose eye is uncovered, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who beholds the vision of the Almighty, falling down yet having his eyes open. So he starts off by giving his credentials. He's making it very clear he's a prophet, and what he's about to say he has heard from God. Now his actual prophecy, beginning in verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheph. And Edom will be a possession. Seir, its enemies, also will be a possession. While Israel performs valiantly, and one from Jacob shall have dominion and will make the savior survivor perish from the city. So what we know here is that this is a, a messianic again. This is a messianic prophecy. The Magi knew through this Old Testament prophecy that an ultimate king was to be born in Jerusalem and they knew that his announcement would be made by a rising star. So this is how they knew. Now there's a lot of speculation by various different scholars about what this star was, and most of it attempts to connect it with an actual astrological occurrence. But it's really unnecessary for two reasons. First, by doing that, we suggest that the Bible has to be validated by science. And that's just not true. The Bible does not need to be validated by science. But secondly, there's just a much more simple explanation, and that is that this star is likely God's Shekinah glory, and it's the same star or light 
that illuminated the nation's Israel's travel in the wilderness for 40 years. God has used these kinds of astrological occurrences to shine his glory and to announce and show that he is leading and caring for them. Now addressing the second question, the Magi knew the child's identity as the king of the Jews, most likely from Daniel's teaching. Now, remember that the Magi are from the east, which is likely a reference to Babylon, where some years earlier, Daniel had been deported when Babylon had defeated the southern kingdom. And Daniel had been appointed by King Nebuchadnezzar as the chief of the magicians. That's another name for the Magi. He was appointed because, if you recall from Daniel, if you know that book, he had interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream properly for him. And as the chief of the magicians, he had certainly taught the Jewish scriptures to the Magi. And we can certainly expect that one of those teachings was surely the prophecies of a Jewish king, the Messiah, who would come and rule the world. And in fact, there's an amazing prophecy in Daniel's book, in chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, which the angel for Daniel predicts precisely when this Messiah is going to first come. So clearly he would have taught this, and so this is how they would have known that this was a unique and a special event, and this is what caused them to pick up and travel some 800 miles from where they were to find the king of the Jews. Now that was a long setup, but it was necessary because it prepares us for the heart of this story, which is the different ways that the world will respond to the birth and the life of Jesus Christ. The different ways that the world responds to King Jesus. So, turn back with me, if you would please, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. Matthew, chapter 2. And we're going to find the first way in verses 3 to 6, and that is going to be astounding or astonishing or amazing, whichever word you want to use to, 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 to emphasize indifference. Okay, so astounding indifference. So follow along with me as I read verses 3 through 6. And then Herod the king heard this. I'm sorry, and when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him, and gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He was inquiring of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. He's referring to a prophecy by Micah. Uh, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, verse 3 begins again with this arrival of the Magi, whose presence has stirred up the entire city, and Herod along with them. I think they were stirred up not only from possibly the size and and, and, and the regalness of this group, but also by this persistent question they were asking of anyone who would listen which is, where do we find this newborn king of the Jews? They're going around the city. They're seeking the answer to this question. Now, having heard of their arrival and the question, Herod gets into the game in verse 4, and he asks the same question of the religious leaders, who are the chief priests and the scribes. But Herod, in his question, adds an interesting twist. So follow along again as I read verse 4 and see if you can see what's different about Herod's question. Verse 4, And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he was inquiring of them where the Christ was to be born. Now, what was the twist? What was different about his question? Anybody notice it? Anybody notice the twist from verse 4 versus the question that the Magi were asking? Go ahead. Speak up the interactive part. What is it? What's different? The Christ, not the king of Israel. Absolutely right. Okay. The Christ. He says, where is the Christ that has been born? Okay. So what's Herod doing? 
he's validating that the king of the Jews is Christ. He's the Messiah. It's the promised one that is going to come. He knew, along with the Magi, this was no ordinary child. And Herod knew that this child was the rightful owner of the throne that he claimed to occupy in Jerusalem as the king of the Jews. Now, the Magi and Herod were convinced that this was a special child. It was Israel's divine Messiah who was going to rule the world. And each of them desperately wanted to find this child, but for very different reasons. Now, the Magi, as I noticed, first approached the people in Jerusalem who either didn't know or didn't seem to care about the answer to this question. Then their question reaches the religious leaders by means of Herod's inquiry. And here is the amazing thing. The religious leaders immediately and correctly knew and provided the answer without hesitation. And not only that, they provided the supporting scripture in the Old Testament as proof that this was indeed the correct answer. So, as I said earlier, verse 6 is a citation from the Old Testament. So, turn back in your Bibles to Micah. It's in the Minor Prophets, so not far back. So, working backwards, you do Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Nahum, and then we find Micah. Micah, chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 6. So, Micah... Chapter 5, it's a little bit of a test. We haven't had to find one quite this hard before. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, and here's what he says. Now muster yourself in troops, daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us. With a rod they will strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, which was another name for Bethlehem of Judea, too little to be among the clans of Judah, so you're this tiny insignificant little town, from you one will go forth for me, okay, so one, probably capitalized in your Bibles, one, this is the messianic prediction, will go forth from me, a reference to uh, God the Father, to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from everlasting, from the ancients of days, so we know this is an eternal person who's coming, just not an ordinary birth. Verse 3, therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in childbirth has born a child, probably an allusion to Isaiah 7, then the remainder of his brothers will return to the sons of Israel, and he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth, and this one, this one person that is going to be born will be peace, which is what we'll look at next week. Okay? So, turn back, if you would, to Matthew again. And here's where I get the label for this response, because this is a rather astounding situation. And why is it astounding? Because they knew exactly what the scriptures say about their promised Messiah, and their response to his arrival is total indifference. Now, I'll bet both the Schmitz and the shepherds were excited about the arrival of their children. Here's the arrival of the messianic son, okay, and yet Nothing. Nothing. They know exactly who it is, and they respond with total indifference. After the appearance of this large contingent of foreign dignitaries and the implications of the questions, no one's excited. No one seems to care. No one sought to seek out the Magi and inquire about the reason for their excitement. And most perplexing of all, not one of these religious leaders had enough interest to travel a mere 10 kilometers south to see if there was any truth to the Magi's report of this messianic child being born. 
Rather, the people routinely went about their everyday life, and the religious leaders were busy with their daily religious practices and sacrifices. In fact, they were so busy with the business of religion that they missed the very focal point of their religion and their faith, and that is the Messiah himself who had been born. Now, of our three responses that we're going to see this morning, this one is by far the world's most common response to Jesus. Simply astounding indifference. The world seems to follow King Solomon's vice in Ecclesiastes where he says to eat, drink, and be merry. So my question to you this morning is, does this response resemble you? Do you live your life with casual indifference to God's King and our Savior, Jesus Christ? Do you grasp the life-threatening nature of your spiritual illness, yet remain completely indifferent to the one and the only one who can rescue you? Now, I do pray fervently that this is not you, but if it is, my advice is simple. Wake up before it's too late. Understand your spiritual need for a Savior and give your life to him and follow him with studied difference, a desire to be around him. Well, that leads us to our second response, which we find in verses 7 and 8. And I've labeled this one treacherous hostility. So follow along with me. I'm sorry. Turn back to Matthew. We have not yet. Matthew chapter 2. Follow along as I read verses 7 and 8. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and carefully determined from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I may too, I too may come and worship him. Now, while most people in the world are completely indifferent to Jesus, there is a group of people in the world who are actively and openly hostile towards Jesus. And in our story, Herod represents this group of people. Now, as scripture will reveal, the primary motive behind this response to Jesus is self-interest, and it's packaged often in deception. So we learn back in verse 3 that Herod was troubled by their arrival because he considered himself to be the rightful king of the Jews. Now, Herod well knew that he was not the real rightful king, and as history recorded, he was ruthless and cruel in protecting his throne. Nothing was beyond his treachery to retain power. Herod killed wives, he killed children, he killed various family members, anybody that he considered to be a threat to take over his throne. So, knowing the Messiah was a truly legitimate challenger to the throne, knowing that he had been born in Bethlehem, he hatches a plan to identify the actual child using the Magi. In verse 7, he secretly calls them into his presence and first establishes the precise timing of the star's appearance. Now, this could have been to perhaps be a ruse of showing interest in this child, or perhaps more likely, if that doesn't work, to set up plan B, which as we leave, read a bit further in Matthew, we learn to be his killing all the children two years and younger in Bethlehem because he was tricked by the Magi and they didn't return. Then he commands the Magi to find a child and report his precise location under the deceptive pretense that he too may come and worship Jesus. So treachery and um, hostility towards this child. Well, as we know from scripture, God will protect his son. But regardless of this fact, the world is full of people like Herod, who live to advance their own self-interest. But God is not fooled by their outward hypocrisy of submission and worship. So as we leave the second response, let me again ask if this response resembles you. Are you living solely to advance your own agenda? Are you religious on the outside, but defiant 
on the inside, either actively or passively? Do you live in outward obedience, but inward rebellion to the commands that Jesus gives us in scripture and the demands that he makes on the life of those who follow him? If this is you, let me say that you may be able to fool people, but you can't fool Jesus who sees the heart. To this person, Jesus said in Luke 6.46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Or, even more scary, just turn a few chapters forward to Matthew chapter 7 and see what Jesus says about this response to him in verses 21 to 23. Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, this is the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, in your name did we not prophesy, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name do many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now those are going to be scary words, because on that day, that's going to be too late. So are you putting up a veneer of what you say is faith, but in reality you have a treacherous hostility towards your Lord and Savior? All right, back to Matthew chapter 2. And thankfully, we don't end on these first two notes of response, which would not be reflective of joy, which is my focus for this week. But we find in verses 9 to 12, the last and rightful response, which is joyful worship. Joyful worship. Follow along as I read these verses. Matthew closes this section saying this. Now after hearing the king, <clears throat> they went their way, and behold, the star, which, had been, which they had seen in the east, was going on before them, until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi departed for their own country by another way. Now, this final response comes from a most unlikely people. And in fact, you may recall last week that I said that God often works through humble people in humble circumstances, producing incomparable results through improbable means. Now, using pagan <coughs> idolaters to announce the birth and arrival of the Jewish Messiah is certainly an improbable means to accomplish his incomparable results. In these final verses, we're going to see this truth in action <clears throat> with this unlikely response of these pagan idolaters to the Messianic king. They arrived. They were again directed by this star, which I think supports my earlier assertion <clears throat> that it's not a phenomena in the sky astrologically, but it's God's Shekinah glory guiding them to the particular household where this child is. And when they found him, the text says that they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I mean, they can't express it any more strongly. They were just effusive in their joy and their praise and worship for this child. The Magi illustrate for us the only rightful response to Jesus, and that is total passionate, committed, sincere, and wholehearted devotion expressed through joyful worship at the feet of God's Messiah and rightful King, Jesus. There is no other response to Jesus than to fall at his feet, recognize who he is, beg for his forgiveness, and receive the gift of eternal life, which is promised to us by Scripture. Now, the Magi's response to the good news. Now, why do I call this the good news? If you remember, those of you here from the summer series, we talked about what is the gospel. 
And we started with the most irreducible element of the gospel, and that is a person, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the gospel in human form. So their response to the good news reveals five distinct characteristics of what a genuine response and genuine faith looks like in Jesus Christ. First, having received this good news through the announcement of the star, genuine faith responds by pursuing Christ. These magi traveled over 800 miles to find him. They were relentless in asking where he was. And when they finally determined where that was, they stepped forward in faith and went to that child, and they immediately went and were guided to him. Secondly, having received the good news about Jesus, a genuine faith responds by rejoicing with great joy. In Matthew 13, Jesus uses the kingdom of heaven, says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and he hid it again, and from joy over it, he goes and sells everything that he has and buys the field. Now, joy lies at the center of finding Jesus, because joy is found in a person and it's not found in our circumstances. Your circumstances do not determine your joy. Who you belong to and who is your savior is the source of our joy despite our circumstances. Now, we like the man who bought the field should be willing to sell out to find it. Thirdly, having received the good news about Jesus, genuine faith responds by submitting to his kingship. Now, don't lose sight of this scene in verse 11. These powerful, influential men fell to the ground before a helpless infant, and they worshipped him. They worshipped him. And this should remind us that someday, every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to to confess that he is Lord. And those that have confessed that in this life are going to enjoy eternal fellowship with God our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those who deny that in this life are going to suffer a fate separated from that in a place the Bible calls hell. Fourthly, having received the good news about Jesus, genuine faith responds in wholehearted devotion by worshiping him. This is why we come together as a body each week. We come together because Jesus is the only God, capital G, worth our worship and worth our praise. It's why we gather as a body. It's why we fellowship as a body. It's why we seek the good of one another in the body. Because we are coming to please him, to honor him, and to glorify him through our worship as we gather as his body each week. And lastly... Having received the good news about Jesus, genuine faith responds by honoring him with our treasure. Okay? Jesus says it pretty clearly in Matthew again. Where your treasure is is where your heart is. Now this is an example of an earthly material treasure, and that's not what I'm suggesting by this. But the kind of treasure that Jesus wants is what he sets forth as the greatest commandment when asked later in the Matthew Gospel, in the Gospel of Matthew. When he says, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And then he threw in a bonus. And to love your neighbors as yourself. So what's the greatest treasure we can give to Christ? Well, unencumbered love for the Father. Unencumbered worship of the Father. And love for one another around us in this world. So let me ask you one more time. Does the response to the Magi resemble you? Have you responded to the good news of Jesus' birth, his sinless life, his atoning death, his resurrection, and his ascension by pursuing him, by finding your joy in him, submitting to him, worshiping him, and treasuring him?
Or does your response look like those who are astoundingly indifferent to Jesus or those who respond to him with treacherous hostility? Now my prayer each and every week is for each and every one here is that you're standing firmly with the Magi in your response to God's King. And if you are, I genuinely believe that we're going to get a chance to meet these former pagans when we join them in heaven, when God calls us home, and that will be a joyous time. So let me close with this. The arrival of Jesus in human history inaugurated the two greatest sacrifices ever known to mankind. The first was the sacrifice of a father who so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die. And to do so, so that sin could be paid for, and that whoever places their faith in him will have eternal life. The second is the actual sacrifice of the son, the perfect sinless son, who knew no sin, but became sin on our behalf, suffered an ignominious death on the cross so that we might have the righteousness of God in him. Jesus voluntarily died to pay for our sins. And this, my friends, is the true meaning of Christness. And I really do want to say it that way. I'm not mispronouncing it. You take the Christ out of Christmas, we don't have this season. This is the real meaning of Christmas. He is the priceless gift of Christmas. And he is the only true source of joy in this season and forevermore. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for these amazing truths. We thank you for the fact that you loved us 